Okay. Let me see. So what what we will discuss today is a topic on critical thinking. Did you have a course on critical thinking before? No. So what do you think critical thinking is? So it's kind of re reasoning about statements, right? Cool. So we have a um, statement, and we have some process which is reasoning. Okay. Um, so what sort of statements do we do we have? Can we kind of dive a little bit more into statements? In general. Could be about the software, but could be more general than just software. That the te techniques and the kind of methodologies are kind of used for various things. So about the statements, um, I can say uh, it's snowing. Is it a statement? Okay. Uh, is it true or false? So a statement could be true or false, right? Um, but if I say um, uh, let's say. Uh, the projector is not working because uh, the cable is broken. Is it a statement also? But what is the difference between the first one and the second one? Yeah? Okay. Yes. But. Um, Exactly. So we may have um, kind of a, a simple statement, which is uh, true or false. True or false. Or we can could have a more um, semantically different statement, which is the reason, right? Reason for something. Or So what else, uh, what, what other statement can we have? Like for example, I say, um, I like real strategy games. Is it a statement? Yeah? So what if I say, Marius likes real strategy games? Is it a statement? That's similar to the simple one, right? It can be the true or false, right? Mariusz either likes the strategy at yes or not, doesn't, right? Uh, but um, what if I say chocolate ice creams are the best? Yeah? That's opinion. That's an opinion, exactly. So we could have an opinion. So what's the difference between an opinion or a simple statement? Right. They kind of appear the same, right? I say it's raining, it can be true or false, or I say chocolate ice creams are the best, it could be true or false, sort of, yeah? Yes. Correct. So this is more universal, and this one is more subject to some constraints, right? So we have uh, some additional constraints which make this true or false, right? Um, so what else comes to mind? So what, let, let's go back to this reasoning thing. So what is reasoning? Which 
Okay, okay, yeah. So so we've got some sort of a statement. Statement. Uh, and it has some other statement. It's confirming the Yeah? Anybody else? Yeah? Yeah. So we have here, we have inference. Or what else do we have? So we, we stop here for a moment. We're kind of discussing a little bit about the different types of reasoning which we could make. Um, so we can kind of infer something. What else can we do? We can, um, there, there are kind of a two very um, broad categories of um, inferences. Uh, it's kind of a deduction and induction. Have you heard those terms before? So what, what do they mean? How do they differ? So what's uh, deduction and what's induction? Yeah. Okay. And induction? Did you have a, like induction in mathematics? Yeah. Yeah. So what was it? It's when you add one and like and if it's true, then the rest is zero. Thing. That's right. So in math, was kind of like if if something is true for x yeah. and it's true for x plus one, yeah. that means okay, it's true for everything, right? So induction is we try to get um, uh, uh, some sort of examples and generalize based on the examples, right? So we say I've seen uh, white um, swans on the lake on Yosa. I, I've seen white swans like in UK. I've seen white swans everywhere. Therefore, swans always have to be white, right? I never seen a black swan, right? So from observations, you've seen only white swans, so then you make a generalization, kind of inductive claim, that all swans are uh, white because you haven't seen a counter-argument, right? So here you can have some simple, uh, like simple facts that you've accumulated, and then you generalize it based on the evidence you have to kind of generalize it. In that, uh, so that's induction, kind of, uh, so usually we generalize. Uh, with deduction, it's kind of a form of inference. So if I have a sim one statement, um, uh, so let's say uh, I'm, I'm saying um, it's raining outside, therefore it will be slippery, right? Because it's raining, it's slippery, so I like, have a simple, simple thing. But if I have multiple, like if I have statements, then we kind of usually kind of connect them and kind of do some inference and that could be called deduction, right? So we call com combining multiple statements, but we kind of usually don't call them statements, right? So when we have something in here um, and something in here and we do the inference, how, how we call those things? Yeah, yeah. Said it louder? Observation. observation. Yeah, we could have observation, but it's a little different. And what do you think? Cost? Um, no, yeah, so cause and effect one position. So, um, those are kind of good, useful terms, 
but they don't kind of fall under, under our hierarchy here, right? So what else kind of gets here? So we have kind of a reason or a claim. Uh, we could have a premise, right? So usually we say, based on some premise or a claim, we're making kind of an inference and we're deducting kind of a, a statement or another claim or another premise and we can change that, right? So in general, those are all statements, but we try to make it a little bit more specific because, for example, we want to avoid using <coughs> opinions, right? Um, so if we try to avoid using opinions and we have some claims and premises and we kind of uh, have a conclusion, right? So another form of um, statement is a conclusion. Then we have what we call an argument, right? An argument is kind of based on something, we conclude something else. If we use an opinion, right? So we say, um, uh, cheese pizza is the best, therefore all student uh, meetings should have only cheese pizzas, right? It, it would be kind of consistent, it's just that the premise is kind of invalid. It's based on an opinion which only is valid for some people but not in general, therefore the whole argument collapses, right? It, it is kind of, you can easily invalidate it, right? Um, so observations and um, experiments, experiments, um, measurements, and so on, they are useful tools to get, to get you to statements, right? They kind of give you mechanisms to obtain kind of statements which then you can use in argumentation and arguments, right? So, uh, and then based on kind of different types of inferences, you can make kind of a claim. So why we talk about all of this? Why it is kind of relevant? Yeah? So the term research came came up. Yes. Research. So the term research is sometimes a little bit, uh, it has a, kind of a, it, like for example, I need to buy a car, then I say I need to do a bit of research, what to buy. Right, which car to buy, what is the best price to value kind of a trade-off and so on, right? So I'm kind of doing research, I'm like reading 10, I'm checking all the offerings, you know, and so on, right? Would you call it doing research? Uh, not really, right? You wouldn't. Uh, who would call it doing research or who heard some other people do, saying I'm doing research? Yeah, I, I've heard people calling it research, right? Is it really research? No, it's not research in kind of academic sense, right? It's colloquial research. Um, so we kind of, when we use the term research, we in this context, we usually mean academic research, right? So let, let's say academic research. Academic <coughs> research, right. So um, what is different between this type of uh, colloquial research and academic research. Yeah? Okay, yeah, that's, that's a good one. So here we have this sort of uh, uh, colloquial research. So here, um, at some point we stop and we kind of satisfy, right? Um, we are satisfied. And uh, what is it? What's the term when you're doing something until the point you satisfied? Yeah. 
uh, I don't know if you know it, it satis satisfies, right? So something satisfies um, the requirements if it kind of uh, reaches a point where someone is satisfied with the, uh, so satisfying, satisfying, right? Whereas here, we need kind of a theory. So we, uh, we stop, um, yeah, so we stop when we end up with a theory about something, kind of more general, right? Uh, so what else is important here and irrelevant here? So it, it, it is, um, so satisfying means kind of good enough. So satisficing, right? Um, good enough. Whereas, can we say, oh yeah, this theory is good enough. I mean, it doesn't work all the time, but like, let's use it. Can we say that? Let's use a theory which is kind of not quite right, but okay, it's good enough. No. So we usually, like when we have that, like we, this is time, and we have some sort of a theory, and this is how good the theory is, right? So that we have some sort of threshold, and say, yes, it's kind of uh, good enough to use, but then let we stop. We kind of always kind of uh, go to the point where it's universal, right? We try to reach a point where the theory is kind of acceptable, globally acceptable, right? So. Like for example, with the um, with the uh, Newtonian physics, with the movement, right? We reach a certain point, but then we continue, and then we got to uh, quantum physics, right? So we know how uh, movement happens with uh, in the relativistic terms, right? Um, but for example, when we analyze um, the movement of a car, we can kind of use the Newtonian. Uh, physics because it's good enough, right? Um, so this, like the science doesn't stop here, it kind of goes here, but for the theories, we can make some assumptions and then use a subset which is kind of a good enough. Uh, we know it, the uh, results are kind of are not perfect and they don't work in certain conditions, but for certain contexts, it, it's kind of fine, right? So we can, we can do that. But in general, yeah, here we stop at good enough. Here we stop when we find out something kind of global, globally universal. What else? What else is uh, here, which is a problem here? Intuition. Yeah, intuition. Uh, but like, uh, I will put intuition in both. We we come back to it. What else? What is, what? Um, what is related to intuition, but it's not intuition? Bias, yeah. We come back to that too. We're really close. It's related to both of those, but that's not what I'm looking for. What else? Why can you, why you are sometimes biased? What else? So what, what else? Like when, when, what do you consider here and when do you stop? Experiences, yeah. yeah so the, the word I'm looking for is emotions, right? So when, you, when you're doing kind of a research for your car, maybe the evidence suggests that this is the best car, you just don't like it. Like you, and you go for something which is not the best, in general, but it's the best for you. you. You kind of feel good about that particular car, right? So an opinion or emotion is kind of relevant for this, but here we should not have it, right? It's sort of irrelevant if something, uh, someone some <coughs> likes something or not, right? Uh, in terms of building up the theory. So the, the thing I was looking for is emotion or emotions. And then here we can build um, we can build a result based on opinions, right? And often we do. What we do is we want to buy a car. We check everybody's opinions, right? Like Joe likes it, or Bob doesn't like it. This guy says it's good. This girl says no, it's not good, and then so on, right? We read everybody's opinions, 
and we make our own opinion and then we stop, right? Based on opinions. Um, here, we can, cannot do that, right? We cannot base anything on the opinion. We have to have evidence. We have to have some sort of facts, right? Um, so the opinions and emotions are kind of irrelevant here, right? So emotions and opinions are kind of on that side, but not on that side. So let's come back to intuition and bias. So with intuitions, um, you do progress on the academic research by having some sort of intuitions as well. You just cannot base your results on the intuitions, but <coughs> like sometimes you have choices what to try first or what to do, and then you can kind of follow your intuitions, right? Uh, but they don't, so they indirectly kind of uh, help with the process, but they don't directly contribute to the results, right? Um, also, what is kind of relevant here is some sort of internal uh, consistency and internal beauty, right? So, for example, sometimes you have piece of software which does exactly the same thing, and you kind of like one more than the other. You don't know why exactly, but you have the intuition that this one is better than this one, right? Uh, sometimes it, you can kind of quantify it. You, you may say this one is kind of easier to maintain because of some facts, but sometimes you can't pinpoint it. Like you don't know exactly why, right? Um, and that, that's okay. Then, then we kind of in the opinion space, because your intuition is kind of your opinion. You don't have that kind of a solid evidence, but it still kind of contributes to progress on, the, on that side. And, and the emotion and bias are kind of linked. We often are bi biased because of our emotions. Like when you're doing your master thesis, you really want to succeed and you're emotionally attached to your thesis succeeding, like whatever experiments you're doing and so on, right? And therefore you will have a bias, right? So for example, a lot of students have a questionnaire at the end which they evaluate some sort of a system that they built and they ask the user how, how much they liked it, right? So everybody is like biased for the results to be kind of positive, right? You say, oh, how did you like my fantastic system? <laughs> or how did you like this uh, groundbreaking, you know, new user interface, right? You're kind of not neutral and you're not kind of on the negative side. You're always on the positive side and you're biasing the results, right? Um, so your emotions can kind of cause bias and that's like, uh, again, what we try to avoid here, right? So we try to avoid bias, we try to avoid emotions. We kind of cannot avoid intuition completely, but we are aware that intuition doesn't contribute directly, right? So all those things are kind of here, but they are not here, right? So when we're discussing those terms and we're trying to formalize it, what we're trying to achieve is we're trying to formulate the process of how we arrive at conclusions on that side such that we avoid those things, right? So for example, that's why we kind of identify what is an opinion and we say, okay, using opinions for the colloquial sort of activities that we do for newspapers and so on, it's fine, but uh, for academic research, it's not acceptable, it's not fine. And then to make the quality of, of your research uh, work better, we need to understand how to do this and how to use those terms such that we kind of uh, make our work better, right? So what is, what is the work of the researchers? What is the work of academics? What's the main task? Yeah? Yes, so um, so the term is knowledge, and then we yeah, let's, let's, let's draw knowledge as a plot. So then, uh, it, it, what you're saying is to kind of extend the knowledge by something that we don't know yet, but it's based on the previous knowledge, right? Um, that's that's great. What, what is knowledge? Because here, 
let's say um, um, colloquially again, let's say I want to start um, skiing. I came to Norway and I don't, I never cross country ski and I want to start skiing. And then I learned that there is a lot of different snow types. I learned that there is a lot of different uh, ski types for different techniques like skating or cl uh, classic. And I learned there's different materials to build the skis. So I, I'm kind of like, I'm spending years studying it and learning all about those things and I'm kind of gaining knowledge. Would you say that I gain knowledge? Who wouldn't say that I gain knowledge? Yeah, I gained experience, but I kind of gained, again, I gained kind of, uh, people do use that term, right? Uh, that I gain knowledge. It's just my knowledge. It's not the knowledge of the society. It's not the knowledge of the humanity. Like humanity already knew all of that. It's just I didn't know that, right? So I kind of learned this. I, I gained this knowledge to myself, but like as a humanity, we already knew that, right? When we, when we say research is extending knowledge, it's not this personal knowledge, it's this kind of humanity knowledge, right? Um, okay, so... Um, so so then what is the... So first, researchers need to gain this personal knowledge, right? So when a researcher starts, so let, let's say what I know is here, and then I learn more and I learn more and I kind of learn this, right? I can never know all of this, right? I can kind of know something, what humanity knows, and I can kind of touch the boundary. So usually it's kind of different, usually it's like this, right? Um, so I can kind of, uh, I can know something, what humanity knows, and I, I kind of see what humanity doesn't know yet, right? And then by doing some project, I kind of extend this, this, this border, right? That's how it usually works. So what researchers are doing is they, first they spend a lot of time kind of uh, learning where, where the boundary is, right? That's not obvious, right? Do you know something that is the boundary of uh, like uh, human knowledge? Yeah? Quantum physics, but what exactly is the boundary, right? So let's say uh, quantum physics is around here, and then yes, it's kind of close to the boundary, but there is kind of a string theory and some other nuanced kind of things which kind of researchers are getting really, really close to the boundary, but if you're not studying physics, if you're not kind of a physicist and working in that area, for you it's really hard to, to say, I'm at the boundary, right? Uh, and also, if you're really close to the boundary, it's not quite clear that you are the only one kind of really at that spot. Maybe there are two or three other people in the world which are also at that spot. So it's a bit fuzzy. It's not very crisp, right? So if you say nobody knows that what I just discovered, well, maybe that's the case, but often like somebody else is also really close there. And you, you've seen that happened in the past where multiple research teams kind of read discovered or rediscovered the same things, right? Um, so for us, it's kind of really hard to, to, to get there, and um, you need to, to study. Like, that's what PhDs usually do. They spend three or four or five years kind of uh, getting closer and closer and closer to the boundary, and eventually kind of reaching the point where nobody else in the world is at. And they can say something about something kind of uh, nobody else knows yet. Um, so we, we kind of, uh, we expand as researchers the unknown, um, no, what is unknown yet, right? But to do that, you need to spend years and years kind of uh, learning yourself, teaching yourself and learning stuff to get close to the, to the boundary. Um, so this is kind of like a, an undertaking which the research community do and um, 
It requires certain uh, rigor and certain methods and certain way of thinking. And it is not natural because this is more natural to us as, as human beings. Uh, and we all have emotions, we all have our biases, we all have our opinions, and we all have our kind of beliefs and kind of belief system. And we all see the world a certain way, right? So actually do this, it's very counterintuitive. It, it, like you always fall into some sort of uh, fallacies and some form of way of thinking which make this work kind of hard. So when we talk today about like critical thinking and the way to structure arguments and to make arguments, it's to us to learn a little bit more of how precisely do this job without falling into this, right? And it's not easy. It's actually very, very hard to do that, right? So if you were to convince me to something, um, most of the time you will not do it purely using this, right? And also if you want to convince anybody to, to anything, uh, if you are a really good researcher and you do this, uh, people will most of the time say, yeah, you're right, but I still do what I want to do, right? They will still follow their emotions and their things, right? You can show them all the evidence that smoking is bad and they will still say, yep, uh, you're right, and they will go for a smoke, right? Why they will do that? Because they are irrational? No, they are rational. They kind of follow your arguments and they agree with you and they are kind of um, whatever. But, you know, we, we have our biases and we have our emotions, right? For example, we might know that uh, we should not procrastinate or we should do certain things certain way, but we still don't do that, right? And it, with research, it's the same. So, um, when, uh, but that, that, that doesn't mean we should not do this this way, right? We sh still should do it in kind of a pure way. But when you're writing, um, when you're writing about um, your project or your software or whatever you need to write in kind of an academic way, you have to do it following certain rules, right? And one of those rules is to kind of avoid opinions. So. How do you know that something is an opinion or that something is kind of a proper premise for drawing conclusions? How would you distinguish it? So let's say you need to pick a programming language for your project. Uh, how would you do that? Uh, uh, the main factor is probably time and uh, I don't know. Depending on the project, you can pick the programming language. But if you want to be something related to the really fast transactions or something, you can use Java or something. But it needs something simpler than that. And the time is not that. Uh, I mean, the time is, for example, we have four months for the project, let's say. Yeah. And this time is for the everything like building, uploading, and experimenting. And mm -hmm. Some languages are uh, easy to learn and start something. Mm -hmm. Some languages take more time. Mm -hmm. This may be some reason to choose the programming uh, language. Okay. And the type of the project also influences the, our choice. Also. The time frame of the project, and the other thing you said is like um, um, what you want to do. It, it's like when you, uh, your project is. But you also mentioned uh, like uh, the performance of the executable, right? Yes. Like some languages offer you better performance than, than others, right? So let's say it's a performance slash optimization. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would also just choose based on one of my projects I already know how to code it. Yeah. Um, if one of them that I know is suitable for the task. Yeah. That, that's good. So that, that re relates a little bit to the time frame, so prior, prior knowledge. You see, we use the word knowledge here, not as a humanity knowledge, but prior knowledge of the team or of a, of a person, right? 
uh, because that's like if you need to spend two months learning something new for two months you'll be not productive and if the project is two months then it's not a good choice if the project is like four years and you need to spend two months of something that makes you 20% more productive sure you should go for it right because then the, you will benefit from the longer project being more productive with the new tools or new skills that you learn um, so that, that's great. So uh, what you did was you kind of enumerated a number of um, factors or a number of dimensions that you would use as a criteria. And then you would kind of analyze options, different programming languages, and choose the one based on those criteria, right? Uh, so you would try to find what is the prior knowledge of the team, what, how long is the project, what what project type we, do we have? Is it like an embedded system or is it a mobile system or is it a game? Uh, because then, like, if you try to do a language which is very um, sluggish or has a garbage collector for doing some sort of real-time system, then it would be inappropriate, right? You need to choose the proper language for the proper type. And then some final considerations about, like, okay, maybe that runtime system or that language is too slow for what we want to achieve. Therefore, the final optimization of performance is kind of also a factor and so on. You can do different ones, right? The, the ones that are suggested here are kind of reasonable, uh, but you can kind of uh, choose other ones, right? So the question is, how did you choose those? Is it um, did we choose this based on an opinion that it's good, that we think it's reasonable? How would you choose those criteria? Maybe because of the opinion also, because for example, we read the Google for recommendation, and it's not that's right. That's right. So our process is already a little bit flawed. It's a little bit unscientific, right? Uh, so that's one, one, one problem. The second problem is, let's say uh, we already know C sharp, but we're doing, um, I don't know, let's say we, we're doing an embedded system, right? And C sharp has a, a relatively large runtime system, right? Um, you know, how should we weight those things, right? Is prior knowledge trumps performance and uh, type of the project? Or is the type of the project really fundamental? Like, if we're doing embedded system, we have to use C, and it doesn't matter, like, if how well you know C. We need to use C, right? Um, so how would you weight the different criteria here to make the final choice, right? So, so first, um, yeah, let's forget about this knowledge for, for a while. So, uh, first thing is the methodology. Methodology for choosing the criteria. So, criteria is the first thing, and then weights. How, how we weight those things, right? We kind of did that, but we did that kind of in a top fashion. Like by gut feeling, by intuition, by experience, by reading Google articles, right? Um, so if, so let's say we have this list. So we have list one with uh, weight one, right? And someone, and, and we did the evaluation and we, we choose, I don't know, we choose C sharp, right? And then somebody else comes and says, no, 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 no. Your list is wrong. You didn't thought about those other criteria. We have list two with weights two, and it's a base of this one. You should have chosen Java, right? Who who who, who is right? That's difficult, right? Uh, how could we do that in such a way 
that we have the universal list with universal weights, and that's the one everybody should use. Is such a list? Does such a list exist? Probably not, right? Um, we can make it conditional on the team, right? So first of all, such universal list doesn't exist because it kind of depends on what the actual team is and what the project is, right? Uh, but what we could do is we can say we have it condi conditional on the team and the project. And given the team and the project, there are cer certain criteria or certain weights that it kind of makes sense, right? Could we do that? Could we have a particular list of criteria with particular weights given a certain constraint on a team and on the project that we need to undertake? I think we could do something like this, right? And that what that would require is kind of analyzing different teams and different projects from the past and from the experiences and so on and analyzing what those kind of are criteria, like how does it work, right? What certain criteria work for this type of project, right? So for example, let's say we have a team of uh, three developers doing games, doing mobile games, right? So if we constrain it so much, do you think we could come up with a, a list of criteria to choose for this kind of constraints? We probably could, right? Um, so, going back to, to this knowledge thing, uh, from one hand, we said it has to be very general, and it has to be like for humanity, and it has to be universal, right? Those premises still stay. Like, we, we want some kind of universal uh, aspects for the, for the thing that we're looking for, uh, but at the same time, we have to consider like, how constrained our problem actually is. Right? So, again, when you're doing a master thesis, usually what happens is you start with something that is relatively broad and you try to come up with a solution for this broad problem. And it turns out that there is no single solution for your broad problem. It's just too complex. There are too many moving parts and you cannot really solve it, right? Um, because it depends. It depends exactly what, like, what subset of this problem you pick. Right, so then what you can do and what you should do is you should constrain it and say, for this, this is the solution. For everything else, I don't know. Maybe this is also a good solution, but maybe there is a different solution which is better, right? Um, all right, so let's, uh, let's have a break. We run out uh, for about an hour. Yep. Uh, how would you compare uh, PhD thesis and master's thesis? Like, uh, PhD thesis is like uh, coming near to the boundaries, as you said.
So we have uh, covered, I think we kind of uh, covered most of it, which is easy. What is hard is to actually do it, right? So uh, I would like you to list me some, like you've written some reports and you've written some uh, kind of a more research uh, things already, and you're going to do that for other courses. So what is your uh, strategy to try to, first of all, let, let's start with, you becoming less biased, okay? So how would you build those arguments in such a way that it's more objective, more looking at different perspectives instead of kind of uh, coming up with the ready-made solution, right? Um, we had a, um, we, we have different students doing different projects and master thesis. And sometimes people tend to be more um, universal, like more unbiased. But some students tend to be very into what they're doing and they really strongly believe it and they kind of, uh, because of that, they are biased, right? So they may argue for something in kind of a very uh, single perspective way, right? So how could you try to not do that? Can bring everything to the numbers, like I don't know, uh, for example, if you are shipping something with bigger or smaller or something like square quantities, now you can uh, so quantifying all the results. Yeah, it's it's more unbiased than the numbers. Yeah, that that's a good one. It usually helps, yes. Um the what else? Um, what is the um, a typical way of conducting an experiment where you are hoping to achieve a particular result such that you can confirm uh, or disprove what what you kind of expect. So, so what what we usually do? Test. Yeah, we test it. But like how? Let let's say um um I I, I have a yeah yeah. So reject the null hypothesis, right? So what? So what would be good is you kind of, uh, you know, let's say that A is true, like, you, no, you don't know, but you believe that A is true, right? Uh, so what you do, you make an experiment which tries to confirm that not A is true, right? So you try to do the opposite, and uh, if you fail, then you kind of confirm it by falsification the other thing, right? And usually that creates a little bit more unbiased uh, setup. Uh, it creates kind of a... A situation where if you have bias it's for not A right because you're kind of trying to test if not A is true right um, because it like by the nature of asking things or setting up experiment uh, the confirmation is always sort of more implicit that than rejection right so um, like I had a, I had a, uh, a master student previous, like a couple of years ago, and we had two user interfaces, and one was um, one was in a 2D, and one was in 3D, and the tasks were the same. So it, there was some sort of system where you had to do certain information processing and do some tasks, and we really believe that in 3D it's much easier, right? But we didn't know that. That was a hypothesis, right? So uh, what he could do is he could set up a kind of an experiment which was trying to uh, 
to confirm that 3D was better. Um, but that turned out to be kind of hard. And also, we don't know that, right? We don't know if 3D is, is better. So one way was to quantify it. So for example, do the same task in both and measure the time or measure some complexity or whatever. So kind of quantifying it. The other one was comparing both, right? So the user kind of get kind of to experience both and kind of uh, kind of compare. And the results were inconclusive, right? Which was good because what it showed that the 3D was not worse than the 2D. The new one was not worse than the one which everybody was using so far, right? So it actually was a negative result in a sense, but it was kind of good for the research. Um, so what else can you do to make yourself more objective? Yep. Yes. So multiple multiple points of view and others. Right? So what are the other researchers saying? What are the pros and cons? How they approached it? Um, um, yeah, what else? Yes. Yeah, we, we were discussing it with uh, just before the break or during the break. That for master thesis, it actually is a very good idea to try to replicate somebody else's research using kind of the same methods and the same assumptions and so on to just see that it worked. Um, I had a like when I was doing my PhD, I had a. Um, a Chilean uh, couple which was doing the research in autopoiesis. And um, there was a, a, another researcher which spent, I don't remember now, but it was like maybe 15 years uh, trying to replicate the, some of the research that they've done um, and based on their the papers and their methodology. So it wasn't a single experiment, it was kind of a, kind of a combination of things. So he tried to do that, he was failing, failing, failing. Yeah. Uh, at some point, one of those guys actually died, right? So he couldn't contact them anymore because one of them died, so he contacted the other one. And then by back and forth, so after 15 years, what turns out was that in the original seminal work with, where everybody was citing and everybody was kind of basing their research on, they had a mistake, right? Because they listed the rules of what it should be, but they were missing two rules which were not listed. And the system behaved the way it should with those extra two rules, but without them it wasn't, right? So then he kind of showcased, it kind of in a way confirmed the results, but also showcased the kind of a mistake that there was in the seminal work. So of course it makes sense, and often you learn by do, redoing it new things. You learn something that the original team missed, or some assumptions that they had implicitly, and they didn't spell out, and so on. So yes. How popular is it? It's not that popular, right? So for doing for a master thesis, it is popular and kind of students do that. But for researchers to repeat somebody else's work, usually it's not that popular uh, because it kind of lacks this kind of uh, uh, exciting novelty kind of element, right? Um, having said that, if you're doing PhD and you want to make some assumptions, like uh, you're basing some, some of your work or somebody else's work, um, unless you're like 100% sure that their results are kind of correct and have been repeated by others already, usually you repeat somebody else's results as well, right? Uh, on a way to build your kind of uh, case. Um, because if somebody published something and nobody con confirms it yet, you don't really know if it's really true or not. Uh, it may sound good and it, it, you may want to build on top of it but you need to kind of confirm it yourself. Uh, so that, like I, I repeated a number of studies from other people. I also repeated this, this two guys work, 
but I found this guy who was also repeating it, and then I used his work, right? Um, yeah. Um, so one more for, for like the techniques. So what, one um, good one which I'm, I'm doing is like, I'm trying to think what if the opposite what I believe is true, right? I'm trying to convince myself that the opposite is true and what, that, what would that mean and how would that work and what is, is it like really possible, right? And if I have uh, some slight kind of, um, uh, you know, shadow of uh, thought that it is probably possible, then I'm I'll naturally become less biased, right? But if I am convinced that no, the opposite is like completely impossible, right? Yeah, but usually you try to do this mental exercise, you will find out that it is kind of possible, right? The opposite to be true. And then it's fine. Then you sort of, uh, you take the, the multiple points of view into account and so on. Right, so then the second one is, knowing this, what are the, um, like how do you write to make it uh, objective? So one technique which uh, in, in Norway and also in Poland is very popular is to use passive voice, right? Um, so if you say, um, passive voice, uh, if you say uh, those experiments were conducted, um, it sounds a little bit more objective than you say, I conducted those experiments, right? Um, but, and when I was writing my master thesis and when I was starting off, I always use passive voice and that's what the tradition is, like in, uh, in Germany, in Norway and in Poland, like in some of the languages, but in English, the tradition actually is to use a f active voice because it engages the reader more, right? So the, the, the benefits of, of being more objective by using passive voice are outweighed by the engagement the reader gets from reading kind of a story, reading a kind of an active voice, right? So in English, I actually switched and I always, almost always use uh, we as a kind of a research team which was doing the research. Uh, even for the master thesis, I, I used we because it was me and the supervisors who were kind of doing the work. Uh, it wasn't just me doing everything. Um, so I, I use we, but you can use I if, if you uh, feel um, it was you personally who kind of did some things, some specific things, and then it's kind of you who can, takes the blame if this is wrong, right? Uh, so then you can use the I, right? Uh, instead of having collective uh, blame for the team, that the team did something wrong, right? And I use active voice. So this, this is one of the techniques you could do, uh, but uh, I would put question mark. I prefer reading active voice, right? Uh, that we did something and so on, but then again, if you use active voice, um, it, it should be kind of a little bit more dry than kind of the, the you know, it, it's not a story you're writing. It's not a novel. You, you don't say, oh, on Friday we went out to the river and collected the samples and then on Thursday we did some analysis. Now, you don't write like this, you don't write like a story, but you can use kind of an active voice to be kind of similar to the passive voice, but kind of not, not a story. It should not be a kind of a chronological story that you write, right? So what else can you do to make it, um, to make your report kind of objective uh, or sound more academically scientific than kind of a colloquial. What's the difference between a blog post and a kind of a research article? Not injecting? Yeah. So, um, kind of a personal experiences, opinions, Anything, anything personal doesn't fit, right? You have 
in the thesis, when you're writing a thesis, you have acknowledgement and kind of a preface where you can put, you can thank your parents, whoever, whoever you love and so on. And then at the end, you have kind of a discussion and conclusions. And the conclusions are usually um, non-personal, nothing personal in them. But the final part of the discussion, you can have a kind of a personal uh, thoughts, right? So you may basically say, I don't have evidence for this, but I believe based on my experiences that this is the next direction or this is the, you know, this to be true, right? And it is valuable, right? But there is a disclaimer that you kind of don't have evidence for it. It's just that based on your work, your feeling or your intuition or your personal opinion is that, okay, uh, this is more likely than this, right? It's okay to say that. In the papers, and the kind of reports, usually we don't have enough space to do that. In the thesis, you have a little bit unlimited space, so you can do that. In the reports, usually we avoid it. So anything personal is kind of uh, not there, right? Uh, what else do we do in the writing? What? Exactly. So, sound arguments, very important. That should be number one. Uh, and you have to, so to have sound arguments, you have to have uh, kind of at least two things done right. What are those two things? So what, what do you need for a sound argument? So remember the argument? The argument is you have kind of this, you, you get the, the conclusion. Right? So if you basically have one, two, and three, right? So we, we need to have <laughs> two things done right. Uh, so the inference needs to be done right. So based on, you know, um, if I said, uh, it's snowing today, a premise, true or false. Let's say it is snowing today. Let's imagine that it's snowing today. So my premise is true. There is no class today. Right? It's like, yeah, what it has to do with snow, right? In some countries, like in New Zealand, um, when it snows, everything is shut down because they are not used to snow and they don't have winter tires and so on. So, like, the city shuts down, right? So, if it's snowing, like, the insurance doesn't work, the buses doesn't work, nothing works, and there is no class, right? So, in New Zealand, when it's snowing today, therefore, there is no class, kind of makes sense. But in Norway, it makes no sense, right? Uh, so, the inference needs to be right. So, the inference has to be correct. And then you have to kind of get um, the correct conclusion. I mean, it, it is sort of the same thing, right? Uh, if your inference is correct, then uh, it means that this, this follows from this, right? Uh, so it kind of boils down to the inference and uh, the choice the choice of claims or premises, right? So for example, uh, let's say you, you need to uh, conclude something and you're picking kind of uh, premises which <coughs> need to correct conclusions, but they are kind of not directly linked to the um, um, uh, to the conclusion. So let's say we want to say uh, Facebook is good for society, right? And we say, look, Facebook has a very good market share uh, and uh, Facebook has been, uh, the stocks of Facebook has been going up, right? So we kind of bring some claims which we can show that they are true, but how that links to Facebook being good for society is kind of unclear, right? So we sometimes see papers like this or sometimes see arguments like this that they kind of are logical, 
they have a set of premises which logically conclude certain things, but then the final argument is kind of, yeah, is that, that there is no link, right? Um, I had a, I, I was reviewing a paper last semester, uh, and um, the, 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 the final conclusion of the paper was that mobile phones help in teaching, uh, that the, the students learn better if they use mobile phones for learning, right? Um, but all the arguments were kind of logical uh, that there is a big market share of mobile phones that uh, are used in teaching and so on, but there was no kind of the direct link that it actually is beneficial, right? It kind of seemed good to try, but it didn't seem that it will be beneficial for the students to use mobile phones for learning, right? Uh, so the final kind of conclusion of the paper was not following from all the argumentation which was in the paper. And the argumentation in the paper was kind of co consistent, it was correct. Uh, that this followed from this, this followed from this, and so on. But then the final conclusion was like, no, you don't actually have evidence for that in the paper, right? There was no evidence suggesting that it's actually beneficial for the students, right? Um, alignment. Yeah, alignment, that's a good term. Very nice. Uh, so maybe we put it alignment. Alignment between the argumentation and the final conclusion. Because usually what happens is we kind of building evidence for something and then we're doing a number of inferences, right? It's not just a single kind of step. Usually it's multiple steps and they form kind of like a tree, right? Um, so you have some premises which then lead to some other uh, kind of uh, premises and then based on this you kind of conclude the final thing. And then if one of them is incorrect, then the whole thing kind of collapses, right? Uh, usually what we do is we kind of make, um, because th there is a lot of assumptions which are kind of either implicit or explicit, which also if none of them, like if one of them is incorrect, then the whole thing collapses also, right? Uh, but usually we don't talk about everything. We just say in the context of this, making all the everything else kind of assumed, then we kind of make the argument, right? Um, but sometimes, um, um, yeah, we, we, we wrote the paper. It's, it's kind of currently under review, under review. So I will not tell you all the details, but the argument was that uh, we, have, we have a structure like this. We have an a, a assumption, and then with this assumption, we have uh, two things, and then we've done some <coughs> experiments. And then with the experiments and with those two things, we concluded with it, right? We're saying, this is true. We know this is true. But this is true under assumption A. If we remove this assumption, we don't know if this is true universally, right? We believe it is, but we cannot claim it yet. If we kind of uh, do the, repeat this for A and for B and for C, and those are kind of different things, and they kind of generalize, then we do induction, and we say, based on this generalization of those things, then we believe this to be universally true, it will be kind of a stronger case, right? But we currently only know that for A this is true, and only knowing for A, we can't really tell for everything else, right? So, um, we, cannot, we cannot say that uh, L is universally true, right? Yes, you wanted to say something. Uh, Reproducibility and replicability, yes. Uh, this is an important, um, important factor and this is slightly different, right? So making things kind of sound objective is one thing and making things replicable is another objective that we also try to strive for, right? So NTNU introduced kind of an open data and open access uh, publishing which uh, encourages you to um, uh, not only publish your results, but also put the data that you've used to achieve your results into some sort of a open um, publishing kind of a setup that other researchers can reproduce and replicate your, your results. Uh, putting all the details about what versions of things have you used, how you did it step by step, 
It boils down to this example I gave you about this guy trying to replicate something for 15 years, right? What, what it means is was like, there was sort of enough in the original paper to reproduce it. He couldn't, he just couldn't reproduce it, right? Because there were missing things. Um, so th this is important, uh, but it, it is not like, I would say it is a, it's kind of a orthogonal a little bit, right? Um, because you can be very biased, but reproducibly biased, right? Uh, like you could have a very biased study demonstrating something that is not true, but other people following your steps could reproduce it, right? Um, which is possible, right? Um, but yes, uh, reproducibility, and uh, we, we have kind of another paper on reproducibility in, um, in research, and we, I will give you the reading on it, like how to make computer science projects more uh, reproducible. Computer science is not the worst one. Um, I think some of the medical medical publications are kind of, uh, because of the money involved, they kind of hide a lot of details and they make it on purpose not reproducible, right? But even with computer science, a lot of papers are not reproducible. Like, they draw conclusions, but other people cannot kind of uh, replicate the study. Um, Okay, um, so I think we sort of more or less covered it. We don't have the, the screen here and it, it is kind of limiting us. So what I'm suggesting is that the next week uh, we, we shift. So we go to B212 on Monday and we don't have a class on Tuesday, okay? Uh, because this room kind of sucks a little bit. Um, so we will have the monitor and I can show you things, right? Go to the wiki and on the wiki I posted uh, I posted one, one thing to read and four videos. Um, there are two videos for kind of a topic selection and papers, which we did in 2018 and 2019. Those are uh, because we, we didn't spend time today discussing the, the project, the topic. Um, and we're doing it differently this year because we will have one umbrella topic with kind of uh, themes. Uh, in the past, we basically just have had teams, teams. So we were discussing like AI, we were discussing mobile games, we were discussing mo monetization mechanism and so on and so forth. So you will kind of get a feeling of what the course reading materials were covering from last year uh, and, and a previous year by watching the previous two videos. But um, it, it is only partially relevant. There are some discussion about doing academic research also uh, so pay attention to those bits. And then the other two videos is a course on like an introduction about argumentation and arguments and claims from another university. It's like a two, two short lectures about 40 minutes. Uh, and he basically follows a little bit what we discussed today, but from slightly different angle, right? Uh, so I want you to watch those two videos as well. Um, so you will have, I don't know about, yeah, you watching YouTube lectures on normal speed or faster? Yeah, you, you can easily watch his stuff on 125. Uh, it, it, some bits on one and a half, but he, um, yeah, you will see. So you, you will adjust it. So I, I would say it's about two hours, maybe one and a half for watching all, all of those videos. My one definitely you can watch like one and a half probably. Um, so that's that's that that that's that that part. I cannot show you the screen, so I will not um, uh, do more. What I want you to do for next week is watch the video, so we we kind of finish this uh, academic writing and uh, critical thinking bit. I will give you one extra paper about reproducibility. Uh, it's good that you reminded me. Uh, and what I would like you to do for next week is also install um, Android Studio and kind of uh, try to generate a Hello World application for Android, right? Uh, so we will do a little bit of uh, practical aspects as we were discussing last week. Uh, not all of you need to contribute, but I want all of you to learn a little bit about it, right? It, it, it's different if you like never did it yourself, and it's different if you try things out a little bit yourself. So install Android Studio, install the emulator, uh, and what we will do next week, we will kind of 
play a little bit with some uh, libraries and with some software, right? Uh, for the project, uh, you don't have to do that, like if other team members want to kind of like carry more practical work, you will do it, but I want you to have a little bit of an experience with the, with the technology. It is at the end of the day kind of a mobile course and we will deal with some mobile uh, applications and mobile libraries, so I want you to get a little bit of an experience and bring your laptop, laptops uh, next week as well, if you have, uh, to the class. And we will meet on Monday instead of Tuesday because then I have the projector and I can show things on the screen. Does it sound good? Right. So, any questions? Great. Thank you very much.